warm welcome <coughs> uh, to uh, one of the most uh, more boring sessions uh, during this conference about business models. Uh, thank you for having me, even though <coughs> it's such a boring subject. Um, well, I don't think so, but uh, and I guess you don't. Uh, maybe you think it's necessary, uh, thinking about business models, or you think it's really fun. I think there's a lot of things uh, <coughs> that business modeling has in common with game design, which we will come to later on. <coughs> so, during this talk, we'll talk about serious games and creative business models. I will go through um, basic business modeling, but also look at cases in various areas, mostly within education, but also in other, other areas. Um, so, quickly, um, my background, who am I? I'm a former teacher. I'm one of the 70,000 Swedish teachers who no, no longer work as uh, a teacher. Uh, then I became a communications consultant uh, and serial entrepreneur, setting up agencies in various places in Sweden and Spain, uh, or rather in Catalonia, uh, which is not Spain for those who are politically aware. Um, and uh, then I ended up in game design, uh, gr founding Growplay uh, Game Studio in Stockholm. Um, and, uh, well, that's enough about me, I guess. Uh, Growplay it's, is a game studio which uh, develops, and we develop uh, games for social good and uh, pushing, you know, we want to save the world. I'm a dad. When I got kids, I totally understand that, okay, I need to, to do something for the world. Previously, I worked with brands like Absolute and Zara and H&M, great brands, um, but I didn't really feel like I, I saved the world. So I got briefs from them, and I sometimes made games or other kinds of utilities and services and entertainment. Now we decided to do our own uh, brief, to, which is a quite big one, which is to save the world. Um, okay, I'll have to skip this one because that's uh, actually a, a spoiler. So, but first of all, uh, what is, how do we define serious games? Many of you might be studying serious games, or some of you might not have an idea at all. Is, does anyone want to, to just shout out what, what, what is a serious game? Yeah, shout out. Yeah, do you have to be serious to play it? Like not laughing and... Okay, good, thank you. Um, any examples? Which one? <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> more cases or more, more definitions? Here we go. Fold it. That's a spoiler. Okay. Here comes the Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, uh, wow, fireworks. Definition, a serious game or applied game is a game designed for primary purpose other than pure entertainment. That doesn't mean it can't be entertaining. So that's a bit what I, ha I have a problem with the term or the, 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 the phrase or the term serious games. Uh, who who of you work with or study serious games in here? Wow. Okay. Uh, then I cannot bullshit you. Uh, so please uh, tell me if you think differently. Or we'll have a Q&A session afterwards as well. Uh, do you agree with this one? Perfect. Cool. So this is, you know, one of the, the examples you, you usually come up with, a flight simulator, which is not even a game, but, you know, a simulation which goes uh, under this, this kind of umbrella series games. And I found out this morning that this is actually some, some does anyone know what this is? People from Khevda? You should be proud of this. This is a stri, I think it's called stri sim in Swedish, and it's uh, being used around the corner um, by the Swedish um, uh, forces, you might say, simulating battle, which obviously, <laughs> well, it doesn't save lives because you don't kill each other when training, but it saves money and uh, also uh, a lot of uh, extra costs. So uh, that, that's a great example of, of uh, serious gaming. Um, you also have this one, which is a kind of a hybrid, I would say. In what sense? Well, it started off as a, a one-person project. It became a big kind of game success. And then 
it turned into a serious game. So this is kind of a commercial game and a serious game. And you know, might know about the story about uh, Microsoft buying Minecraft and then there were some Finnish guys before that who put together uh, Minecraft education using Minecraft as a canvas for designing um, educational situations used in schools. And, then, and now Microsoft has developed that further, which is now called micro Microsoft Education. So this is a great example of, of, a, of a hybrid. Uh, do we have the time or a clock anywhere? Because I don't. Uh, holy, okay. So. I have to speed up. Uh, serious games market. Is there any money in it? Anyone works in the serious game market? Is there any money, Adam? Okay, great. So uh, this actually uh, confirms what uh, Adam is saying. There is a market out there, and it's growing fast. Um, this is one figure, about nine billion dollars. Uh, it's going to grow to $9 billion in 2023. Another, uh, another um, source says it's going to grow to $8.1 billion in 2022, which makes sense to then arrive to tonight. So, and some of the highlights, I think, in, the, in these findings are that, is that the Asian market is, is booming. Not, I mean, that's not a surprise, really. But um, uh, that, that's going to grow big. And also, the education sector, the educational sector is the one that's going to grow the most within this serious game area, you could say. So, how do we? Now we're going to talk about the boring stuff, right? The business model. So, what is a business model? Well, a business model is a kind of a map or a plan, a designed uh, blueprint of your business or your product uh, to help it work and to, uh, <laughs> and to kind of avoid you failing because that's, that's uh, especially if you start from scratch, that's, that's not um, uncommon. So, um, now there's a super cool effect showing the business model canvas and this looks pretty, pretty, you know, depressing in a way, but if you look into it, how many of you know about uh, business model canvas? One. Two, three. Okay, great, because then I might um, inspire you to check this up. This is the most important part. We could actually stop the presentation now uh, if you want to do something else. And Google this and check it out. We can talk about it more, of course. But look at this and dig into it, because it's, it's interesting in so many ways. Uh, it's actually a super cool way to design your business or design your product. There is even like game adapted business model canvases out there. What is this? Well, it actually maps out all different um, factors that you need to, key factors that you need to take into account um, to make the, your business work or your game work. So in the middle, you have the most important part, which is the value proposition. So what problem does it solve? Or uh, what's the gains for the consumer? It could be entertainment, right? But that's not serious gaming. So serious gaming probably fixes a problem. And if it doesn't fix the problem, it's going to fail, most likely, if it's not entertaining. You know, it could be pure entertainment. Then you have all the others. I'm not going to go through all these in details now because I want to go into cases as well. But all these um, uh, boxes here are filled with the key factors. And you have partners, of course. Who are the partners? Do you have any partners? Uh, most likely you have. Who are your consumers or customers? Uh, what resources do you need? Uh, what's the distribution? Is it Steam? Is it PC? Is it mobile? Uh, is it a board game? Um, and how do, you, how do you distribute the board game? Do you need to work with Amazon or, you know? So, so that, th those are the, the mapping uh, factors you need to do. And it's interesting because initially I, I told you about game design and business modeling. Uh, it's kind of similar because it's an iterative process. In this case, this is an example of actually a game uh, being developed. And this is the fourth round, I think. Yeah, day four. It might be a sixth round. But this is something that you, uh, you, you have a, hypo a hypothesis. 
you, you go and test it, you talk to people, you could talk to your family, friends, but most, it's better to talk to people who don't really, you know, who, who, people who could hurt you without feeling bad, if you know what I mean, being, being honest. And then you go back to the drawing board and then you redesign it. And those are the red uh, parts up to the right, if you look, yeah. Uh, those are the ones they discarded. This doesn't work. They found out, that, okay, no one wants these features or these partners, they don't work. So they took them away uh, and came up with uh, other, other new ideas or hypotheses. So, and this is kind of game design as well, right? So you have a, you have a design or have a prototype, you go and test them. You, does this work? Does this stick? No, it doesn't. We have to change this. We need more pickups or we need, uh, uh, this should be a multiplayer. I don't know. So, so <laughs> for you who think this is boring with business uh, modeling, you should look at it as a design process um, uh, instead. And it's a hard work, you know, you have to, you have to sit in a room or, or work for, for, you know, for, for uh, in, in many loops to get this right. Okay? Um, so, uh, if you're a startup or a game studio, you could have different approaches. Uh, you can have an um, inside out or internal external approach. That means that you develop something that you believe in. And that's the case with my studio. We, we, we developed something that we thought the market needed in terms of serious games. Um, and uh, that's a high risk because you don't really know it. Then you have the other approach, external, internal, that someone comes to you with a brief or they want something in particular. Um, and then you could do both, which is also something that we've done. Um, so work for hire um, is obviously one way of, of um, earning money. You do work for other for others, and there's a couple of things you should work uh, think about uh, when you work for others. Um, it's a game is a is an odd bird or it's a, it's an odd thing to to sell to to some people. Um, if and games could be used in many ways. I've made a, a, a created a couple of advert games where you um, where you create a game to communicate a brand value or to uh, recruit consumers or members or whatever. And it's quite hard to, to, uh, to convince a client um, and talk about the regular game uh, terminology like engagement or time spent or even quality uh, aspects. They need to hear what they usually hear. So you have to, depending on what market you're going to, uh, if you're expert in games, you need to kind of adapt to the market that, that you're talking to, or the this, this segment, or the professional um, uh, segment that you're talking to. Um, oh, that was the same, right. Another one, thing to think about uh, is the IP rights, because if you create something for a client, and you come up with a really, really interesting, not only game, but maybe character set, then, you should try to protect it because it's, it's your work, if it's from you, obviously. You could do licensing work as well, working with branded characters or, or, or whatever. That's a different story. But this one, I guess most of you know about this one, Dumb Ways to Die, came out in 2012, and then the game came in 2013. And this is an advertising agency who came up with everything. Um, and they tied together, they, they put the team together with the illustrators, character narrative, uh, the composers, you might have heard this song and everything. And, and I, I checked them out the, uh, yesterday and they have this uh, shop, so they sell merch and stuff. So this is a brand itself uh, coming from an advertising campaign in Australia. Uh, and this is, it, it, I, I'm not sure actually who owns the rights. It seems like it's the client who owns the rights. So I don't know if McCann, Ericsson in Melbourne are really super happy about this. Maybe have a kickback or something. So, from our side, Grow Play, we tend to use this, um, we, we try to use this Pac-Man uh, uh, um, approach, which means that if things come your way, and it's an outside in, or external, internal, uh, we try to say no, you know, the art of saying no, to everything that doesn't really go into, this may sound like a no-brainer, but sometimes it's not, but to try to really understand what's good for us 
uh, and our own games and our own products. So we try to say no to projects that is too far off our own kind of trajectory. Uh, so this is a quick example of uh, uh, what we did for Swedish television last year. Um, I think. Uh, and it's the Christmas calendar game for those Swedish people here. There's this uh, TV show uh, until Christmas, and then there's a paper calendar that kids open one you know, uh, slot at a time, and then there, there's a game. So uh, we made this game, uh, and we talked to Swedish television about uh, what it should be, and then we tried to, uh, not like, in a very respectful way, we kind of agreed on a game concept and game mechanics that we were about to develop anyway. Um, so in, in this case, we took on a job work for hire, and we also um, increased our own structure capital, you could say. Uh, I think I have to speed up a bit, so, uh, um, so excuse me if I'm rushing. Um, this is a different example of series games in advert gaming or advertising. These guys are called Flarry, a Stockholm-based company, but the guys are from Falun, really nice guys. These, they have built a community um, of users playing really, really like simple kill, uh, time killer arcade style games. And then they go to brands and organizations and sell packages uh, where they appear in these games, and then the users can win perks and get like uh, coffee free at 7 Eleven or a s hot dog or whatever it is. So, check it out. Uh, this is an example that we did with Max Hamburger a couple years ago, and that's the other way around. No, no, that's not the other way around, but that's the inside out perspective. That we created a game about littering and pollution for kids. Uh, Max Hamburger, which is kind of the Swedish version of McDonald's and, or Burger King, they um, distributed this game, a digital game, instead of a disposable plastic, plastic toy, uh, which is bad for the environment, uh, Max uh, did a statement distributing, distributing uh, uh, just a flyer with the code for the game, uh, the digital game. And this, the, back, the kickback for them, or the value for them is the what is called then um, advertising value equivalent. So um, in this, here you see a, a full page in Dagens Industri, one of the biggest, or oh, the biggest business paper in Sweden. So um, there are a lot of ways for the client to get, um, to, to get return from investing in a, in a real already existing game. This is the, another example of ours, um, which is also a hybrid. We, we have a sponsor in Sweden, which is Södra, a, a forestry company, big, super big. Uh, and they pay us for distributing or, or making this game for free for everyone in Sweden. But in Norway, Denmark, Germany, China, Brazil, everywhere else, we charge uh, for the game. So that's also an interesting way. You kind of client, you finance the game uh, together with the client, and then you could also get returns from other markets. And for them it's a win, and for us it's a win. Um, this is a service, <laughs> sorry, software, software as a service example, or a game as a service example. This is a different business model. World Warcraft uh, usually is the like, example of the first game as a service um, success, you could say. Uh, so what is this? Well, it's a subscription service. You don't buy the product. Uh, you you uh, rent it or you subscribe, and you can choose different service levels. Um, and for you, as uh, and you can play on multiple. Often you can play on multiple devices. So for you as a user, it's good. And for the developer, this is good because. Um, this gives you a prediction of income, or revenue, rather. Um, it's not that dependent on peaks in sales. So if you have a bulk of clients, month one, month 10, you will probably have more or less the same. Uh, so you can predict financing um, uh, over a long period of time. And uh, in series games, Kahoot, the Norwegian success in education, is a great example of that. Uh, it's multi, um, 
device, um, and it's, it has different price levels, so check them out. They are growing like crazy and doing a great job. Um, yeah, this is a, an old example of advert gaming. Um, uh, well, not much more to say about that. This is a different way of, 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 of uh, getting the return from um, the advertising value equivalent that I talked about before. So if PewDiePie is talking about this game for his 65 million users, it has a great, great value. Uh, much, much bigger value than if one million players would download and play it. So that's a different way of, of looking at, at returns. Okay, I'm rushing through here. Uh, what time is it? Sorry for... Oh, you have it there. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So, partners. You would probably look for partners. That's one of the key factors in the map of business modeling. Remember? Have you Googled it yet? Do you have the business model on your phones? If you don't, get it soon. Uh, so, partners are really important. Uh, and partners could be... Um, for instance, in mobile, could be uh, Google Play or um, Apple App Store. On PC, it could be Steam as a distribution partner. Um, it could also be content partners. It could be branding partners. Um, this is a, an interesting uh, company in um, London called Playmob, and they create campaigns to drive awareness around social issues, uh, using existing games. It could be small game studios and big ones. I think Rovia ha have worked with them, but also smaller, smaller studios. Um, another model, now it's going to be a lot of education cases here. This is a, a uh, well, actually it's a Finnish company, Sanoma, um, but they have a strong presence in Sweden. They are um, uh, killing in Swedish, I mean, they, they are <laughs> having a lot of success in Swedish schools. Um, with this <clears throat> pretty basic game, but very, very uh, well thought through uh, in terms of connecting to the curriculum and also to their existing um, kind of catalog of books. You know, this is an, uh, a traditional um, kind of publisher for schools. So their business model is giving this out, for f not for free, but for a really, really cheap, I think it's like 1,000 crowns, 100 euros for one school for one year, which is nothing. But their business idea initially is to then uh, create loyalty and sell more books. So the game can also drive other revenue streams. There are a lot of Nordic examples here. Uh, this is um, uh, Dragon Box, uh, which also is about education, um, especially um, about math education. And they have teamed up with hardware partners. And that's a way for them to penetrate the school market, because I don't know if you know how, how the educational system works, but it's pretty, it's a jungle. It's pretty nasty to understand all you know, all, all uh, channels into the school system, only in Sweden. And then you have other markets. So they've teamed up with hardware partners. In this case, I think it's uh, Lenovo and Huawei to add a hardware, a pad, together with, with their educational pack. Uh, continuing uh, in schools, there are a lot of niche market marketplaces coming up um, in all aspects. But um, in schools, they are just popping up like mushrooms. So um, this is an example of an American one. Again, a, a publisher and a provider of school, um, well, anything related to schools and education. They were lagging behind. So they teamed up with a company called Fingerprint, and we, as a game studio, happen to be on their platforms already. So now um, we are uh, published on this uh, school platform in the US called uh, Really Good Stuff Education, reaching 85% of American preschools and schools. Um, and this is a super niche platform, and they are coming, uh, uh, they are popping up 
everywhere um, on, on, on various markets right now. So keep an eye out for these ones. Continuing in the school world, um, this could also be a partner. Uh, these are the guys who actually created Minecraft, ed uh, Minecraft Edu, the Finnish guys, Santuri and the, his uh, pals. And this is a site called Teacher Gaming, uh, which is you kind of uh, making deals with existing games, and then they help out with creating um, the activities and lesson plans for teachers connecting the games to the curriculum. So if you have a game which is necessarily not educational per se, it could be if you think twice. I mean, Minecraft, for example, was. Uh, and you might have something similar. Uh, you can contact people who know how the schools, uh, how, how pedagogy or education works, and then tie them to and involve the game and introduce them in, in, into a, a lesson plan or a subject. Uh, this is a, a general hub for gaming, uh, social gaming, not, not social gaming, impact, social impact gaming, uh, called uh, Games for Change. You might have heard about it. Um, so, moving over to cost management. Uh, because that's also a part of the business canvas, costs, because everything has a cost, right? Your time, um, you have to buy stuff. Um, if you are delayed, if your release is being delayed, it's a kind of an indirect cost. Um, so you need to keep track of costs. Uh, but there are ways to, to uh, deal with this. So for instance, you could actually work with a community. You could work with crowdsourcing, um, crowd innovation, and there's uh, something called citizen science, which I think is fantastic. I've never done anything in that field, but I think it's fantastic. And someone told me about it, said Fold It, right? Yeah. So uh, who in here know about Fold It? Okay, I'll show it. I'll just show a quick video. Uh, I'm not gonna watch the whole video, but it's it's really interesting. Fold It is a multiplayer online game in which players compete and collaborate to find well-folded protein structures. Proteins are molecules fundamental to life. They are often called the machines of the cell. Understanding their structure can help to fight diseases like AIDS, cancer, and the flu, develop novel biofuels, create cheaper commodity chemicals, and lead to other benefits. Folded is designed to be played by people who have no biochemistry background. The concepts, visualizations, and tools necessary to play the game are taught by a series of introductory levels. So These are offline puzzles. Basically, um, the publisher provides a solution, a game, for everyone who, who are interested in this and who are like savvy in terms of uh, puzzles or you know, uh, understanding 3D models. And, Thousands of people around the world are playing this game to try to create the most stable protein and they are ranked and compared and competing with others. So this is a fantastic example of citizen science uh, connect, uh, in connection with series games. Uh, check it out because they have been around for a long time and it's still, it seems like it's still, still working super well. This is a game called Quiz Clash, a Swedish game, uh, Quiz Kampen for those of you who understand Swedish. And they have this uh, user-generated um, solution where you can actually uh, provide content to the game. Uh, I don't think they pay uh, the, the, anyone in here uh, submitted questions to Quiz Kampen? No. Did, all right. Uh, they, I don't think they, they, they pay the, the, the contributors, but uh, they should because that's a fantastic way to not only cut costs in terms of, uh, use, uh, in terms of content generation, it's also a great way to create loyalty and ambassadors. So a quick uh, review of funding trends uh, in terms of social impact, um, if you're into that. Uh, there, there are more and more business angels, big funds, and institutions uh, willing and really passionate about investing in serious games that make a difference. So um, um, 
the future looks, looks bright for us who are in this business. Uh, they, these two examples are UNICEF, they have an innovation fund uh, supporting um, projects and games that might have a positive impact. Um, Norsken is a Swedish fund, uh, pretty new, one year or something. Um, people behind Klarna and, um, uh, and other big, big um, tech millionaires or even billionaires um, are participating and supporting that, that, um, that initiative. Um, and as I said, family offices, business, um, business angels, corporations. We haven't even talked about corporate innovation and open innovation uh, because time is soon up, I can see. Uh, but, but there are a lot of opportunities to team up with, with kind of rare, in, in kind of rare uh, teams, unusual teams. Um, but one top tip is, is to, to really keep track of the impact you're doing. So uh, since it's not entertainment, if it's education or, or if it's awareness or something else, make sure you have a, a theory of change and you can actually measure change and, and use that as your, your kind of weapon in the fight for money, if you, if you may. Um, uh, just briefly going to mention this initiative in Sweden, which is called Ignite Sweden, uh, which is, is about what I told you uh, uh, before, corporate innovation, where startups or game studios can team up with big corporations like Husqvarna, Ikea, Alfa Laval, all the, those big ones and smaller ones, and create um, projects together that are beneficial for both. Because the companies, they need innovation, new ideas, those are out here and in the kind of the community, and they love to, to, to get in contact with you if, if, you, have, if you have any, uh, if you have things to, to, to offer them that could actually um, long term uh, create value for them. This is an um, uh, initiative in, in Karlshamn uh, uh, called EdTech, uh, EdTest. So this is a test bed. Uh, this is a different way of, of reaching partners uh, and testing your product. So <clears throat> uh, we're actually going there next week. They have uh, uh, an ed test starting on the 21st, um, 23rd, uh, to present our latest educational game for teachers and students. Um, uh, and for those of you who are interested in education and based here in Sweden, check these out. Uh, this is the game actually that we're going to present and it's going to be super uh, nervous but also exciting because in the end uh, you have to show your baby to someone at some point and showing them to the most kind of critical and and uh, picky users that's that's really that's really uh, well super super nervous about it um, okay I'm out of time so uh, we'll uh, move to uh, over to questions and feedback because I think we can have interesting discussions. Many of you know a lot about serious gaming and, um, and so. So please, any questions, opinions? Hello, uh, what were the biggest challenges you were facing when you were starting this company? Oof, I mean, you always have this funding challenge. In my case, we, we came from fairly successful businesses before, so we had the luxury of not being, you know, pressured that much. On the other hand, I also, I was, I newly, I was a new, newly, what do you say, uh, father, I just had kids, so you have to kind of, you can't just, you know, but, but funding is one of them. Um, and then understanding the landscape, because I, I don't come from a gaming kind of, which is good also, because um, in serious gaming, you need to have a different, you have to have a business mind, uh, you have to have a more holistic kind of approach if, you, if you're open for more, more than the entertainment, the consumer segment. Um, but finding, you know, finding the arguments, trying to, to convey clients about the value of spending time and engaging in a story or in a, in a theme which over time 
uh, pays back. That's kind of, you know, especially in, uh, I come from advertising and communication before, and that's kind of super. They need quarter, quarterly figures and reports. So um, that's also challenging. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. So, uh, I have a question. It seems to me that what you describe when you talk about serious games is not really a one big market. It's rather yeah. very many parallel markets. Yeah. And you had your uh, Pac-Man figure where you uh, had some discussion on that. But I would like you to elaborate on exactly how you think when you try to find those synergies and on what level of abstraction, so to say, you're, you're thinking about that in your business strategy. Yeah, I, need, I have to be honest that the Pac-Man model looks great and we try to kind of follow it. Um, but we are also, or have been, quite opportunistic. So we haven't really had the, the, the luxury and time to flesh out a really detailed plan for that. But, but I think... Um, we look at different things. We look at so if we accept a, a, a job or or take on a client, it has to be either value based. Well, almost always it has to be value based somehow. We wouldn't do a you know an advert game for cigarettes or anything. Uh, maybe most people wouldn't. But but. Um, uh, values are important, and then also in terms of game design and. Um, game mechanics, we need to feel kind of um, confident or comfortable with those those parts that we are supposed to. There, there should always be some kind of challenge in the in the project, but but um, we need to keep keep the stick to our roadmap, kind of. Otherwise, I think we would be lost. I don't know. Was that the answer to your question? But it, you're right, it is a really fragmented market. And as you see, it's going to grow uh, a lot. And I've been talking a lot about education, but there are so many other areas. We haven't, I haven't even touched upon health, I think. Uh, that's going to be huge. Um, right. More questions? Uh, yeah, you just mentioned health, and that's kind of what I was going to ask about. Um, you're you, you've mostly been talking about public-facing games, you mm. know, that are distributed widely. Uh, what, uh, what do you know about if there are any markets for extremely specific games, mm -hmm. like yeah, medical games, yeah. VR for anesthetics and other purposes, yeah. or extremely specific training for mm. companies? Mm. Uh, is there a real market for such things? Yeah. Uh, we don't specifically work with those kind of niche games. I mentioned the sim game in the beginning, you know, the the, the battle simulation uh, here in Khevda. That, that's super specific, right? Um, so those business models are totally different. I cannot, and I don't think that's even uh, public information, but I don't know really how they um, put together that deal. But all these procurement, because most... Most of these solutions might be procurement um, um, uh, processes. And uh, there's always a price factor, and there's always, you know, so many different factors. If you do it publicly, but very niche, then you could go private. Then you, the, I, I don't really have a good, question, uh, good answer to that. But obviously, uh, the, the cost per user is much, much higher. So you, in the end, need to have a really high return as a client for me, to, to make that investment you know, reasonable. That was a long answer, uh, a non, long non-answer, non I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is, because in your presentation you mentioned many projects in Scandinavia, but do you think that emerging economies, for example, in Latin America, are markets that are suitable for this kind of projects? Or maybe they don't have enough infrastructure for that? Yeah, they have. And, and the thing is, that it depends on the channel. 
But we're now in discussions with one, one of these, you know, niche marketplaces for education, and they see LATAM, Latin America, as a great potential for them because it's often overlooked by the other players because you always go for the US or Asia or in third place Europe maybe. But you know, the, 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 that's where the money is. But if you, if you can capture a pretty big market, um, a, a so-called blue sea, you know, red sea, blue sea. A red sea is where all the competition is. The sharks are eating each other. The blue sea is where, where, the, where the hardly is no competition. That could be very profitable. Um, but again, I would do a, a proper market research or, you know, um, depending on, is there anything specific you're, you're, you're thinking about? I'm just thinking how many of these countries have a very slow development with mm. education and many are very mm. delayed. Mm. So there is a market for that. Mm. I, I'm just thinking that maybe there is not enough development in technology in right, certain countries right. to be able to yeah. provide computers to yeah. schools and that. You remember the case I told you about where, the, where Lenovo actually provide the hardware? There are a lot of these uh, projects going on. Facebook uh, Green, no, what they call Google Green, I think. And all, all these uh, companies, because for them, these um, developing markets are untapped markets for them. So they want to be there, of course, for, you know, for business. And then they team up with, with um, content providers um, and, and solutions to, to, to make sense to be there. And in many of these markets, mobile is a way in because it's cheaper. You don't have to have like fiber. Like in Sweden, we have every, any house in Sweden has fiber connection now. You don't have that in certain markets. So mobile is a very, very efficient way in, in these markets. Uh, and you can create fantastic you know, solutions for mobile as well. Uh, what do you think about the market of non-digital games and how does this compare to, to digital games? Yeah, a good question because... In terms we, of education. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We actually started making uh, board games. But uh, I'm not touching that now <laughs> because, I, because it's too hard for us. It's too costly for us to do that. Distribution, stock, everything. If you're a big player uh, or if you have, you know... That's that's fantastic. I think there's there's something happening when you're you know just playing a card game or something. There there are other things happening than than a multiplayer game online. Then there are also these hybrids. You have online games, multiplayer in the same room, of course. But yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we have colleagues working with card games for business uh, management and stuff. It works fantastic. A company called World of Insight in Finland, for instance, um, they're coming s strongly now. So I think board games or physical games are, are re but it's not scalable in that sense. So for us, uh, we focus mainly on, or well, only on digital right now. But the, I can mention the Dragon Box example you saw before. They also have a, like a kit with books and um, physical games. Into the, so they have a 360 kit, you could say, um, which is a neat, neat, neat uh, bundle. Uh, would you consider gamification? It's, it's a radical question. Gamification, would you consider it as part of uh, serious games? And the same question for simulation, like flight simulators and things yeah. like this. Yeah, uh, I think there are so many uh, definitions of gamification. So. Um, it's hard to say, but yes, many of these solutions are like gamification solutions, especially in schools right now. <laughs> I'm only talking about education, but you have a lot of gamified solutions for various reasons. It's, easy, it's easier to create you know, badges, bullets, uh, points, and leaderboards and stuff on top of something um, than creating a narrative chronology, you know, it's hard, it's hard work. So just gamify something is easier. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, a lot of th those things are going on as well. So I don't know, in five years, maybe there will be a clear distinction 
between serious games and, and gamification. I'll run over here. Thanks for our questions. Not many in the room, but you are the brightest ones, I think. Hello. Uh, Hi. I'm just uh, wondering if... Uh, what's the probab probability of... Uh, you know, a, a more developed uh, working memory education, because I think that would be pretty good, uh, con considering uh, those that have a problem getting the uh, the information into their heads <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to get more. You know, maybe yeah. maybe a triple A or something. Right, right. I think that games have. Games have a, a fantastic opportunity to, it's a fantastic environment to test and try and experiment. And, you know, if, if, if you, if you um, play a game for the first time, any game, a commercial game, you always try it out and you always do this stuff that you're not supposed to do because you want to try it and see what happens. You know, how does the environment react? If I, you know, jump and try to break this, what happens? Does it break? Um, and, and it's cheaper in games to do that. So uh, I think that's kind of applied knowledge. So you learn stuff, you learn addition, you know, one plus one or um, um, really complex stuff. In the games, in a game environment, you can try them out. And that's when you actually learn how to use your knowledge, applied knowledge, like knowledge in use. And if you do that, you get a deeper learning experience, a deeper understanding of, of, of what you're learning, and thus you remember it uh, in a different way. Um, I'm not a brain uh, researcher, but we are working with, not brain researchers, but, but almost. So, so I, I, I can almost guarantee that, that this is kind of uh, true. Uh, but it's not just the how to use knowledge, but you know to absorb it. That, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I think is like the big problem because mm. we are living in the uh, information age, mm -hmm. which uh, has you know loads of information, and mm. uh, the brain can only uh, absorb so much. Mm. So if your question is that if we're gonna be able to expand our uh, kind of brain capacity in the future. No, more like creating a game that mm. uh, focuses focuses on learn, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, getting a better working memory. That's like oh, yeah. ab absorbing knowledge sure. and to use it. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, uh, as a student, uh, yeah. I can have hard time learning by myself. Yeah. I need uh, help. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. If you're interested, you could. Th this game that we are developing now for schools is actually a so-called multimodal learning experience, where you can. Some people want to read stuff on their own. Some people want to just go and do it, test it. Does it break? Yeah, it, it broke. I go back and then I read about it. Some people want to hear, or you know, multimodal in the sense that you you um, you choose how to to digest the knowledge that leads to, you know, further on. So, um, if you're interested in that, we, I mean, we could talk more later, but of course, people are looking at this uh, to provide a more diverse way of, because we're all different, and there, I think there are about 10% uh, in an in a average classroom have, have some kind of, um, I don't know the word in, in English really, but um, n not disorder, but they work differently. Um, and they need different ways of, of, of learning, which I also think everyone, I mean, come on, who, who loves to, you know, to be in a, in a classroom with 25 other people doing the same thing? So, so this is actually a, a question for us all, I think. Thank you very much.